Thank you everyone for joining us for today's presentation, Knowing Your Online Enemies, Cybercrime and the World of Computer Hackers with Dr. Thomas Holt of Michigan State University. While everyone gets settled in and participants, participants start joining, I'd like to take this time to tell you a little bit about IGI Global. IGI Global is a publisher of the latest research in information and computer science and technology as applied to business and public administration, engineering education, medical and healthcare, and social science through our books, journals, cases, and databases. You will find Dr. Holt's research, along with hundreds of other resources dedicated to the subject of online social technologies in our InfoSide databases. And our InfoSide books. Um, these databases host books, journals, teaching cases, and themed collections segmented by discipline and topic. Our InfoSide database offers thousands of course and research supplements. Currently, we are offering a 30-day free trial of our InfoSide databases so you can experience these amazing collections for yourself. For more information, please refer to our website or contact eResources at igi-global.com. To get started with today's symposium, I just want to review a few housekeeping items to let you know how you can utilize GoToWebinar software and participate in today's web event. Here we are looking at an example of the GoToWebinar attendee interface, which is made up of two parts. The viewer window is on the left, which allows you to see everything that the presenter will share on their screen. And the control panel is at the right. Within that control panel is how you can participate in today's event, so let's look at that first. By cl clicking the orange arrow, you can open and close your control panel. From the view menu, you can also set your control panel not to auto-hide when inactive if you prefer to keep it open throughout the presentation. The audio panel provides audio information. By default, you have joined the webinar via mic and speakers. Click the audio setup to select your computer speaker or headset devices. Or if you prefer, you can join the audio via telephone by selecting use telephone. To use your telephone, enter the audio pin, audio pin listed. Today's webinar will be very interactive and collaborative. We will reserve time at the end of the presentation but for Q&A, but should you have a question you'd like to ask immediately, you can type it into the question box. GoToWebinar software also allows the ability to raise your hand in response to a question. You will find that functionality under the audio mode tab as well. Simply click the yellow hand button to raise your hand. As a final reminder, today's webinar will be recorded and everyone in attendance will receive an email with a link to view the recording of today's event. Thank you for taking the time to join us. Today we have with us Dr. Thomas Holt of Michigan State University. Dr. Holt is a criminologist whose research focuses on computer hacking, malware, and the role of internet in facilitating all manners of crime and deviance. Dr. Holt wrote the book Corporate Hacking and Technology-Driven Crime, Social Dynamics and Implications, and was also featured in the 2012 Encyclopedia of Cyber Behavior, published by IGI Global. He, re he received his PhD in Criminology and Criminal Justice from the University of Missouri-St. Louis in 2005. His work has also been published in various journals, including Crime and Delinquency, Deviant Behavior, the Journal of Criminal Justice, and Youth and Society. At this time, I will turn the presentation over to our guest, Dr. Thomas Holt. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for having me today. It's very good to be here, and uh, thank you all for coming online. I am going to uh, hopefully pop up my presentation now. Uh, can everyone? See what I'm seeing? Perfect. Excellent. OK. So uh, for today, we're going to cover a range of issues pertaining to computer hacking. Uh, we're going to try to cover a couple of different issues, starting with the idea of what is a hacker versus what is an attacker. 
in thinking about the problem of computer hacking generally, we have to give some context as to who is a threat and how we might characterize that threat. So we'll talk a little bit about how we might differentiate these groups. Then we'll talk about the motives for hacking generally, what drives an individual to engage in these behaviors, and uh, the communications mechanisms that are often employed by hackers or attackers, regardless of where they are, and give a little bit of context about the tools that may be used to engage in different types of attacks. Then we'll also talk about the ties between individual hackers. Sometimes when we discuss the hacker community, whether in academic circles or in popular media, particularly in films and uh, television shows, sometimes hackers are presented as sort of lone, difficult people who can't get along with others. Uh, that you know, idea of a hacker living in their parents' basement just hunched over a computer because that's the only thing that they can relate to. And we'll try to dispel some of those issues today in talking about how individuals know one another, engage in the hacker community, and then be seen in a global context. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about the norms and beliefs of what we might characterize as the hacker subculture. Because people know one another, they engage in online conversations and offline uh, discussions and, and different activities, it's important to understand how individuals structure their perception of what is a hacker, how people gain status within this community, and what drives individuals to spend their lives and hours and hours of every day looking at technology in some way, shape, or form. So let's start with this issue of a hacker versus an attacker. When we talk about computer hacking, one of the most important things to recognize is that it is a skill set. It is much like any other body of expertise, whether it's handling a firearm, whether it is some sort of martial art, whether it's the ability to cook. It's a skill set that can be applied for various purposes. And in thinking about the issue of hacking, we typically hear it discussed with regard to either theft of sensitive information, whether it's personally identifiable information or uh, governmental data, that comes into play, particularly in the context of espionage, whether it is the recent uh, use of Flame or Stuxnet. Uh, and by a show of hands, how many of you have heard about the use of Stuxnet or Flame? Uh, well, I don't, can't see the uh, hands, but anyway, uh, this is a problem that has emerged uh, over the last couple of years that has given a, a lot of uh, questions as to how we perceive the problem of malware and its use in the global community. We also see hacking being used for fraud, whether it is to steal money from individuals knowingly or complicitly through the use of phishing, or through more surreptitious mechanisms like, say, a key logging software that captures personal data. And then finally is this issue of hacking as it's used for terror attacks. In the last couple of years, we've seen questions about the issue of Al-Qaeda and other extremist groups being able to leverage cyberspace as a means to engage in attacks against nation states or individuals. Some people have even questioned whether the hacking group Anonymous might be thought of as a group of extremists or terrorists or if they are just simply an annoyance. But regardless, we need to think about how the skill set of hacking is applied. And in talking about the attacker community and the problem of cybercrime, we might differentiate the two groups based on the notion that hackers generate tools and knowledge. A hacker has the capability to develop a piece of software that can be used for an attack. They might have the understanding and expertise to develop zero-day exploits, recognizing that there are vulnerabilities in different types of software and hardware, and then trying to find a way to exploit that vulnerability. And so a hacker is an individual who's using their skills in order to apply them in a very unique way that hasn't been done before. I've been talking about this in a criminal context, but we could also argue that hackers can use the same skill set to engage in security. The individuals working in corporate settings often have to think much like an attacker in order to better defend their resources. So hacking has both offensive and defensive capabilities. The attacker community is somewhat different, though. The attacker groups we might think of as people who don't have the necessary skills to develop resources for attack, but instead can use those created by hackers in order to engage in different offensive attacks. So the group Anonymous, for instance, releases a tool called the Low Orbit Ion Cannon that can be downloaded by any individual 
in an attempt to utilize it for denial of service attacks against a specific target. These are point and click tools. They don't require any understanding of how it works. Just simply the user has to know if I download this, enter in the target and push go or push the activation button, the attack will begin. So that's a much different set of skills than what we might see generated by the hacker community. And in that regard, we can differentiate the hacker and attacker groups based on where they fall within the overall population of the hacker community. In a global context, it's very hard to know how many individuals might be classified as hackers. Uh, the academic research argues it could be a few thousand people, it could be a hundred thousand given the total number of individuals now online. But regardless, we do know that the hacker community is a meritocracy. They judge one another based on skill sets and abilities and the way in which they can apply their skills in an actual uh, network environment. So when we talk about hackers versus attackers, we might be able to classify them based on merit. And this uh, slide here gives you a sense of where we might see these individuals fall. At the top of the hacker community is a very small group of individuals who have the skill and capability to develop new tools, to identify vulnerabilities and exploits that didn't exist previously. We might think of these hackers as the innovators, the folks who pose the biggest threat and have the capability to change the way in which we need to think about cybersecurity. So the use of Stuxnet in an attack against the Iran pardon me, the Iranian nuclear plants at Natanz and the other facility. That's a type of malware that we had never seen before. People had speculated that you could have weaponized malware, but no one had actually seen it being used against an actual set of industrial control systems. And so its use and its actual presence is a complete game changer. Now we have to think strategically about how this threat is going to play out against any kind of target. Below that group, we have a much larger community of semi-skilled actors. These might be hackers in that they can apply their skills for different uh, methods or for different tactics. And a small number of these might also be thought of as attackers. They have the capability to apply skill sets, but they don't necessarily have that pure skill of the individuals at the top who we might otherwise classify as hackers. And then at the bottom, we have a large population of unskilled actors. These are primarily going to be either attackers or in a hacking context. These might be individuals who are called uh, script kitties or noobs, depending on your parlance and your familiarity with these groups. The unskilled actors at the bottom are going to gain tools, information, attack techniques from the two groups above them. In fact, when we look at the way that information flows in the hacker community, it tends to start from the most skilled actors and then slowly funnel down through the chain of semi-skilled to the bottom of unskilled actors. It's these unskilled folks at the bottom who might download an older tool or download something like the low orbit ion cannon and then use it in an attack against a group. In fact, their primary interest is in making something either break or cause some type of harm. In fact, that's why we talk about script kitties as being a tremendous annoyance. They download tools, they run them, they don't necessarily know how they function, they just know that they get a specific kind of outcome. And so these are the individuals who pose a problem for system administrators because they produce a lot of noise, but they don't necessarily produce a substantial impact on security. It's those skilled actors at the top who might have the ability infiltrate systems very slowly. The advanced persistent threat that we're concerned about is likely to come from these skilled hackers or perhaps even some of these semi-skilled actors. But it's that lower group of folks at the very bottom of the pyramid who are going to potentially have the opportunity to move up the chain, but they have to really develop their skills over time. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of these issues in a few moments. With uh, this idea of the pyramid, though, Let's take just a second and consider this issue of knowledge a little bit more fully. When we talk about an appreciation for how attacks work, in the 80s and 90s, a hacker had to have a pretty demonstrable skill set. The technology of the time was not like what we have now where you can pull a system out of a box, plug it in, and it works. Instead, you had to actually read manuals, you had to have some sense of how the device functions, even the ability to code and program was important. But now things have changed dramatically. 
and the emergence of a very skilled attacker community and, a, and hacker community is engendering those without skill to engage in different kinds of attacks. Uh, this quote from Iscorpitz is a good demonstration of what I mean. Iscorpitz, if you're not familiar, is a Turkish hacker who at one point held the world record for web defacements. Very skilled, very interesting individual, and one of his uh, fond activities is to create videos of his attacks and post them online so that others can use his expertise to feed their knowledge base. So this quote here, the expertise areas of hacker groups are different. If a hacker wants to harm a site where she or he has an obsession, they will. If they can't, they'll get help. If they can't do anything, they can stop the publication of a website using a DDoS attack or a denial of service attack. If they want to, they can cause harm. The ones who have enough knowledge and information can manage this. Otherwise, it's very difficult. The ones who don't have enough knowledge can't get help as well. So there's differentiation in how a person is going to attack based on what they know. And there are also some barriers to entry. If you demonstrate to people that you don't know what you're doing, then that might limit your ability to get information or to gain enough of an insight into an attack to make it happen. But there are enough different resources that are now available that if a person wants to engage in an attack badly enough, they'll find a way to do it. And this quote is, is very illustrative of that. So let's move on for just a second and now talk about the motives of the hacker community. What is it that tends to drive individuals to engage in either hacking or attacks generally? What we might refer to as the malicious actor community. And some of these ideas pertain to non-malicious, non-deviant hackers, particularly the issue of uh, status. But we'll talk a little bit more about this in depth in just a moment. The idea of this framework of money, entertainment, ego, cause, entrance to a social group, and status comes from my colleague Max Kilger with the HoneyNet project based on uh, some of the old motivations for uh, spying and for espionage, as we might think of in the Cold War. And many of these ideas do play out today in the modern hacker community. But what's interesting is that they're mutable. A person's motives can change with time. We can see different motivations or targets based on the environment that a person lives in or different social trends that are pertinent to that person or to their segment of society. So what drives one person might be different from what we see compelling another person to action. Let's start first with this issue of motive. And with regard to money, it's become a very, very large driver for different types of attacks. In fact, the hacker community now operates a large underground marketplace where people can buy, sell, and trade different tools to engage in attacks, as well as data that might be acquired post-attack. So if you compromise a system and are able to exfiltrate a lot of data, you can sell that information to other interested parties who might not be able to acquire it on their own. This is an illustration of an ad for a tool called Fragus, and it's an exploit pack. It's a little older example, but it's a nice way to demonstrate what I mean by motive. A skilled actor creates an exploit pack. It's a toolkit that can be applied to any system, so long as you can compromise a server and host the product there. Individuals can in turn be infected by going to that website. And Fragus will infect the browser of an individual's computer rather than, say, the operating system. So you can compromise a larger number of systems through a much more easy vector, like the browser, rather than trying to send an email out to a lot of people. So with Fragus, this person is selling the tool for a variety of different purposes. You can see they offer different exploits, different resources, depending on how you want it to work. And uh, they even give a nice screenshot here of how much it costs, or at least uh, how effective the tool is by country, by operating system, and by the type of exploit. So it's, a, it's an interesting way for a person to make money. So the high-skilled actor who creates this exploit pack in turn sells it to others in the open marketplace for them to use. So this gets at this issue of the pyramidal shape of the hacker community and attacker community. <laughs> Beyond money, we can also see a number of people who are driven by entertainment. Hacking is something that can be relatively neat to watch. If you've ever seen anyone programming or coding or getting inside of a system and learning something that they didn't know before, there's something exciting about it. It can be a relatively fun thing to do, to watch someone who knows what they're doing apply their skills in an innovative way. 
And these are just a few different examples of how individuals might hack for entertainment. Uh, some people like to mod their consoles or change them, adjust them to make them work in ways that they previously were not supposed to. And that fits in with a traditional definition of hacking going back to the 1950s and 60s. We also have a, a sort of malicious description here of an individual who hacked a, uh, a school administrator's system in order to see what was on there and then emailed it to everyone else. Uh, we also have an example of uh, an actor who was big into compromising Japanese high schools because he was bored. And so the origination of the attack relative to the value of the entertainment derived was pretty big. So this is one reason why some people might hack. And this fits into either a malicious or non-malicious context, depending on the person. In addition to uh, entertainment, in the last decade, we've seen a massive increase in the number of hackers operating based on a specific cause. One of the largest causes seems to be that of a specific nation state. And if you've seen anything in the news lately, one of the biggest cause-based attacks goes back uh, through the Mandiant Report to the Chinese governmental uh, military organization engaging in various kinds of cyber attacks. The uh, graph here, timeline of APT1 compromises, this is taken directly from the Mandiant Report where they're talking about attacks directly motivated by state sponsorship, trying to compromise different systems or different targets in order to improve or affect their capability. Uh, this uh, screenshot on the left is taken from a hacker forum in China where you could basically sign up to become part of a civil defense force for the country. So you can engage in different types of compromises, whether offensive or defensive, in order to effectively defend your nation. In addition to that, uh, within cause, we can see a couple of different applications of skill. Uh, we've seen a massive number of web defacements uh, pertaining to either a religious, political, or ideological event. Uh, the Turkish hacker community is huge into web defacements. If you've ever taken the time to go to Zone H, which maintains information about web defacements, you'll see Turkish hackers commonly report their defacements to the site. So that way there's an ongoing record of who is being impacted. We've also seen the anonymous community become heavily engaged in various forms of protest over the last couple of years. Whether it's the Occupy movement, whether it's getting involved in the Arab Spring, or in various local uh, skirmishes based on interest. So cause has become a, a prominent factor for hacker behavior and attacker behavior as well. In addition to the various motives we've talked about, we've also seen a general value in hacking for either status and individual ego. In the 80s and 90s, when hacking was in its infancy, we could see people start hacking to gain some sense of how technology worked. Being able to demonstrate your basic appreciation for a system or make it work in a way that no one else knew before could actually generate a lot of attention. So, uh, for instance, if you've ever attended a hacker conference like DEF CON or perhaps HOPE in New York, you'll see people come out and talk about new things that they've identified, whether it's a type of exploit or a flaw in a system, that's the kind of thing that can generate a lot of attention for that person, and it can gain some respect for them. In the 80s and 90s, the more status a person had, the more access they might have to underground groups. Now that's changed a bit, but we still see people who are gaining prominent attention in a global context based on what they can do. This is an older example, but it's a, it's a good one to demonstrate the value of status. Uh, a, hacker in France created a standalone denial of service tool and then released it online. We tracked the tool over time and actually saw it crop up in some Spanish language forums in South America. And in South America they had basically taken the French language pack for the tool and added in a Spanish language pack. Well, subsequently we saw it appear in a Russian forum where people were saying this is a great tool, a great resource, download it if you have the time and they were attributing the tool to different creators. And in this kind of global marketplace or global environment, where you can see attackers gaining information from various sources, status can be acquired in this way. If people are talking about you in a different environment, it's a good way for people to begin to know who you are to generate some attention. And in thinking generally about these issues of motive, 
This is just one way to think about how we might characterize the world. This is in no way a comprehensive type of overview. It's a map that is just meant to kind of spur some conversation. In thinking about the world, we might try to place different countries or different hacker groups into buckets. So within the US, certain parts of South America, uh, Europe, Asia, we can see a long-standing hacker community, one that's been around since either the emergence of technology or the 80s when uh, the internet was still in its infancy. The red areas are more emerging. We've seen a greater acceptance of technology over the last couple of decades, and we don't necessarily know where to place them. And then the blue category we might define as an undefined community. Either technology is still up and coming, uh, internet access might be heavily throttled or restricted depending on governmental rules and guidelines, or even just general limits in how much bandwidth a person can have. So in thinking about the hacker culture in this way, we can then try to overlay motive. And so in the sort of core areas, we might think that individuals in the United States, South America, et cetera, these core hacker communities, to be driven primarily either by money or status, occasionally by cause, but it's very context dependent. In the red areas, we might expect to see a greater proportion, uh, particularly in China, India, Pakistan, et cetera, a higher degree of either money or cause-driven attacks. But in Central America and in Africa as a whole, we are much less clear as to what to expect. It could be money-driven attacks, could be cause, could be status. It's very hard to say. We've seen a little bit of everything, and it just depends entirely upon what is going on. So this is just meant to, to kind of give some initial characterization to what we're seeing. Moving from motive, we can now talk a little bit about the way in which individuals get information and gain insights into hacking. Whether we're talking about malicious attackers or skilled hackers, we've seen a lot of different ways for people to connect. Generally, when we talk about the hacker community, there's a lot of context given to the virtual environment. People connecting via internet relay chat or through forums, occasionally through blogs if they're uh, big into computer security, or even just general websites of interest. Uh, you can find podcasts about hacking and various other things. But there's also an emphasis on real world conversations as well. In the various hackers that I've had a chance to research uh, and talk to for uh, interview purposes or otherwise, there's always this emphasis placed on peers that they know in a virtual space, but also those who they know in the real world. The real intersections that a person might have with hackers could be based around conferences, could be a shared uh, space where you go. Uh, increasingly in the United States, we've seen the emergence of maker communities or maker spaces where you might go and there's just lots and lots of technology to play with and individuals to share information based on what they know or how they can share it. And in looking at the virtual environment, this is a screenshot of different forums from around the world. Basically, if there is a, an interest in hacking or in computer security or computers generally, you'll find some kind of forum or group to support it. Uh, you can see there's an Arabic language group at the top right, a Russian group, masafaka.ru, at the bottom right, and then uh, the Chinese dark security team, all the way up to the Guatemalan group, Cracker GT. Now, unfortunately, the crackers aren't around anymore, but they were at least a, a force for interesting discussion about hacking in uh, Central and South America for a period of time. Concurrent to the forums and different online spaces, we can also see a range of hacker conferences. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's DEF CON, there's HOPE. These are kind of the oldest associations and, and hacker meetups in the real world. But there are also things like Freaknik, in uh, Tennessee, uh, Nauticon in the Midwest, CarolinaCon in North Carolina. So there are pockets of these regional groups, whether they're driven by the, uh, the group the 2600, which is a hacker publication that was very popular for a long period of time, or alternatively, uh, there's an increase in DEF CON groups or DC groups that are an offshoot of DEF CON. And we even have seen an increase in general hacker conferences in a global context. Uh, the chaos constructions meetings in Germany are quite big. Uh, in fact, the logo at the top right is an image of a combined group for hackers on a plane. So you paid $1,337, you got to go to both DEF CON and the chaos meetings. So there's a wide range of 
places that people can go to meet up and to talk about hacking in the real world. When we talk about communications, though, it's important to note that there are variations based on regional interests. While we generally see conversations in forums or IRC, the way in which people might directly communicate with one another varies. For instance, in China, there's a big emphasis on the use of either QQ or Baidu as a means of connecting with others. In Russia, there's a, a massive emphasis placed on ICQ. Uh, we still see people using forums and IRC periodically. Uh, and rather than Facebook, their preference seems to be for live journal in terms of blogging or blog spaces. And in Turkey, we see people using MSN Messenger for some reason. But there's also an interest in Facebook. And depending on the depth to which an individual reveals information about themselves, we might see uh, some ways to access a little bit about who they are in some kind of space that doesn't tie into a handle or some kind of nickname. And we'll talk about that more in just a moment. So there's communication preferences that vary. And in thinking about the way in which people engage one another online, as information flows and tools develop, as I mentioned earlier, there's this trickle-down effect. What has changed the game dramatically for hackers and in turn the attacker community is the emergence of paid marketplaces where people can go to buy sophisticated tools or data or resources that they might not otherwise be able to develop on their own. Increasingly, there's been a lot of focus given to how these markets operate out of either Russia or Eastern Europe. Uh, if you've looked at any of the Symantec reports, while we see attacks from around the world, there's still some emphasis placed on these communities in the development of malicious tools for different kinds of attacks. And in my own research, we've seen a number of different resources that are bought and sold through these marketplaces. Uh, we have botnets that can be bought for a few hundred dollars, depending on what you need, to denial of service attack tools that are driven entirely through the use of botnets. And if you're not familiar with a bot, it is a type of malware that basically infects the system and in turn allows an individual to remotely control it. So if you take over one system with a bot and are able to infect multiple machines, you can chain them all together to create a network of infected systems. And you can leverage them for a variety of different things, whether from sending out spam to denial of service attacks. So bots are an important resource in this marketplace because they engender different types of activity. People also sell Trojans, uh, whether it's a virus or some other kind of malware. We see people selling encryption services. So uh, if you have a tool that you want to use, you can combine it with an encryption software program that will make sure that it gets through an antivirus system. So your system, while you might perceive it to be secure, might not be able to identify this otherwise well-known tool because it's been encrypted. Uh, the same thing is true for hackers and polymorphic engines. They're just a way to help increase the likelihood of success for an attack. And just to give you a sense of how these marketplaces work, many individuals will post an ad, uh, and these are largely driven either by forums or by IRC. And in their ad, they'll explain what they're selling, how much they're selling it for, and then they'll ask for contacts to take place in ICQ, email, or to a limited extent, private messaging systems. And in doing so, you pay for your product before money first, everything else second. So once you pay, and payment systems are usually either going to be web money or liberty reserve, there are two types of electronic payment systems that ensure immediate delivery of uh, money. And in turn, then you'll get whatever product it is that you've paid for. A limited number of people will also accept Western Union. And Western Union is an important resource, but it also adds a layer of organizational complexity because that means you have to have someone who's willing to go to a store to pick up money on your behalf. And so it raises questions about how many people are involved and how much individuals might know others in a real world context in order to get their money. We see money mules and different individuals being used to acquire currency and uh, send it from place to place through Western Union to that end. And uh, a number of groups will also use escrow payments. And escrow systems are interesting in that they provide a measure of trust. So since it's always money first, data second, or product second, it's hard to know whether or not you can reasonably feel like you're going to get what it is that you've paid for. So an escrow service ensures that everyone is satisfied. If uh, I were interested in buying, say, a piece of malware from a person, 
I would contact an escrow payment provider, tell them what I wanted to buy, who I'm working with, and I send the money directly to the escrow agent, who holds the money in reserve for the seller until such time as I confirm I've received what it is that I paid for. Once I tell the escrow agent I have my product and it's satisfactory, they'll release the money to the seller. And they might take 10 to 20% off the top for their services as well. And it's interesting because we don't often expect there to be any sort of issues of trust in an underground community like this. But since they don't want to be ripped off, they want to make sure that their business operates smoothly, this is a way to ensure that individuals have some mechanisms to ensure that they're happy with the performance or with the product. So escrow payments are an important system. And in thinking generally about products and services, what's being bought and sold, uh, this is an uh, uh, indication of various cybercrime services that are offered in a sample of Russian web forums uh, from Chu, Holt, and on. This is a report that we published for the National Institute of Justice in 2010. And you can see that uh, individuals were selling things like denial of service tax, proxy services. So if you're trying to connect to a specific resource, you can pay for a proxy to do so. Also spam services buying entire databases of email addresses that were harvested in different ways, or spam distribution services, or even tools to engage in an attack. And uh, with web hosting, we also see individuals providing services to ensure that things like a phishing site or malware hosting are stable and secure over time. So there's a full bore marketplace to engender low-level actors to engage in more sophisticated kinds of attacks. Just to give you an example of what an ad looks like, this is one for spam services. person says, I'm offering your attention for a mass mailing service, uh, acceptable prices, good quality, high speed. So they're talking about this in a way that we might otherwise associate with a legitimate business. They talk about where their email addresses come from. For $120, you get a million email addresses or a million inboxes. And uh, for $150, you can separate it out by country and they say that they have data from the U.S., uh, from New Zealand, the U.K., Italy, Germany, etc. And then they have databases based on a specific interest. So if you're looking to send out some spam about work at home schemes or alternatively something about dating, you can see that they have uh, resources that are broken out specifically for those purposes. Uh, for instance, in the spam for dating, they've got 200,000 email addresses that can be used for this purpose or for uh, a spammed database, there's 1.8 million addresses, and they're updated frequently. So this is just one way to think about how cybercrime is enabled by skilled actors tailoring resources to the unskilled. For web hosting, we saw some interesting discussions as well. Here, this person's ad is talking about where their resources are hosted. Uh, you can say that they have access to channels in Moscow, Hong Kong, the USA, and Malaysia and they have legal servers for various products or for various prices. So depending on what you want to do, we will have either cracked resources that are otherwise legitimate or actual legal hosted services that we can offer for your disposal. And they tell a little bit about how it works, what it does, and they even say money back for dedicated servers, but there's a very specific circumstance in which they'll give you your money back. If the service is unavailable because of their fault, then they will replace the server or try to give you your money back. And that's an interesting point. If you want to make sure that whatever it is that you're doing is secured and stable, then you want to be able to work with a person who will be flexible and give you what you need. And that speaks to this next slide. With web hosting services, individuals are quick to tell others what they will and will not do. In this case, they say specifically that they don't want to host or do anything pertaining to child porn, zoophilia, sites that promote violence, or products, pardon me, projects aimed at breaking into government organizations or executive branch bodies. Child porn is one thing that most everyone agreed they wouldn't host, and it's thought that this is because of the tremendous legal risk that arises, given that law enforcement agencies usually in a global context, are quick to respond to complaints about child pornography, and the laws are very strict around prosecutions for these offenses. Many felt that this was a little too high risk for their behavior or for their activities and services. But the second example here, I'd like to offer your attention for hosting services for resources of non-standard content. 
this is the kind of thing that speaks directly to a cyber criminal's needs. They'll host logs, so they will acquire data that's uh, obtained through different types of malware. They will host Trojans. They'll do uh, wares or uh, pirated software or pirated media, depending. Adult products, which could be porn or other adult content. They will host botnets. They'll send out spam on your behalf. They'll do pretty much anything just so long as you tell them. So service providers are quick to make it clear to everyone what they will and will not do for a certain price. So the amount of resources that are available for pay is important. But it's also good to note that there are free resources that are out there. And there's a life cycle currently that can be seen with regard to malware and different types of attack tools. As I mentioned earlier, since the hacker community is pyramidal and this affects the attackers below them, a product that might be sold in a marketplace eventually over time loses value, either because it becomes a well-known attack tool Others might begin to try to develop similar products and take them to market, thereby creating some competition. And even in some cases, individuals will buy a product, crack it, and then host it themselves to make it free. So we see that there's an evolution of a product's lifespan. And as a product goes from being a high value and expensive resource to one that's publicly accessible, as it becomes publicly accessible, individuals from the uh, sort of unskilled community will begin to use them. And the free tools that are available make it possible for actors to engage in more sophisticated attacks. But it can also add to the complexity of identifying an attacker. If they're using an old but well-known tool that can be identified in any place, and can be downloaded for free, it can be hard to know who it is who is responsible for the attack because it might have multiple signatures attached to it. And so it becomes a, a challenge to discern why it came to fore. And just to give you a sense of the different types of free attack resources that are out there, this is a screenshot from a Turkish forum for a tool called Turkojan, which is a, a Turkish Trojan that can be used for different purposes. Uh, and these are just a couple of different examples of what we found through a quick dig through a Turkish forum. But you can find virtually any kind of tool or code currently in the market in some free iteration. In fact, one interesting point about free tools is that some of the skilled hackers will actually put malicious software into what appears to be an otherwise free download of malware. So that way they can infect a script kitty or a low-level attacker and direct traffic out through their systems. So giving a degree of insularity or anonymity to their attacks. And this is, this is an interesting point about skill again. In thinking about the connections between individuals based on on or offline connectivity, what we know more than anything else is that the underground community of hackers and attackers is largely what we might characterize as collegial. They are generally driven by loose connections between one another. They can get information about different types of attacks or different behaviors in a variety of different circumstances or contexts. Generally, most individuals are going to offend on their own. They're going to get a tool, download it, and try to use it in some way. If they purchase a tool, then they'll try to use it to the best of their capabilities. But we see a very small number of attacks that are driven by groups or by teams, where there is some sort of rigid specialization where one person codes a specific portion of the product and another codes a, a different section, or some kind of specialization in the course of an attack. Uh, for instance, as I mentioned earlier about the APT1 attacks coming from China, that sort of very rigid and organized structure is relatively uncommon among the larger population of non-skilled, non-traditional hackers and attackers. But at the very high level of sophistication, you might see a few more of these present. But in generally trying to characterize them, this is what we might otherwise see. And in thinking about social ties, one way that we might be able to track social ties over time is by looking at different resources. This is a sociograph of some analyses that we did of the Russian hacker community based on information provided through open source channels in Google and through a social networking site. And in looking through profiles for known malware and hacking groups like Damage Lab, the Hell Knights crew, Hackzona, and Zloy, 
we were able to identify different members and individuals who ascribed their handle or their nickname as members of these groups. And you can see that they're all interconnected in some way. So everyone seems to know one another in one way, shape, or form. But when we try to parse through these relationships, we can see that there are different relational structures that are present based on individual knowledge. So the density or the thickness of the line here is a demonstration of group ties. And you can see that uh, the group in the corner here, Hackzona, is more deeply tied to a group called Ruhak and Mazafaka relative to, say, a group like Zloy or uh, Kupzu. Alternatively, a group like the Hell Knights crew is deeply connected to Damage Lab and to Kupzu, and Kupzu is also connected to Damage Lab. So there are some isolates on this side relative to the other. So the density of connections is important. Some people can belong to multiple groups at once, as a way of ensuring that they have exposure to different sources of information. The more that you check on a day-to-day -day basis, the more sites you go to, the more uh, forums that you visit, the more deeply connected and in the know you are about what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis. And if we try to map out how people know one another, through the use of a social networking site, we were able to find profiles for members of these different groups and try to map them out to see how much individuals truly know one another. And the thickness of the circles in this sociograph are a demonstration of how many friendship connections an individual has. So you can see that some people have multiple friends. You can see that there are others who have very few. And uh, in looking at members of groups like Zloy, which are the green dots, they're relatively clustered in the center here. But we have members of groups like Haxona and the Bugger Hucker crew that are distributed throughout. And when we try to refine this a little bit more, in digging through Google and through other resources, we were able to try to assess an individual's level of threat. In other words, how likely are they to engage in different types of attacks? And this image is a representation of threat level. The red dots are high-risk actors based on the sale of malware or stolen data or their affiliation with a group as a moderator or super moderator, someone who has responsibility in a forum that traffics in cybercrime and attack tools. The moderate risk actors are people who post regularly in these sites but perhaps don't have a specific tool that they've created or a certain type of attack that they're attributed to. Our yellow nodes are no risk. In other words, we couldn't find anything about them that would specifically suggest they're engaged in illicit activities, but they're regularly posting on computer security sites or appear to have an interest in hacking generally. And then finally, our green nodes are unknowns. We couldn't find anything about them in any one online context. That doesn't mean that they are of no risk or high risk. That just means we can't find anything about them. So these green dots might be unknown knowns or high-risk people that we just can't find because they are very good at concealing themselves or they engage in illicit activity under a different handle. Regardless, as we look at this distribution, you can see that we have uh, a number of our high-risk actors and our moderate-risk actors in the center and they are deeply connected to others. The size of their nodes suggests that they're not tied to a lot of people, but based on their, their presence within the sociograph, people are looking to them for information. The fact that they are not on the edges, or at least there are not many of them who are isolates, means that people are looking toward them for information, and they tend to be a through point for ideas and knowledge. And that speaks again to this issue that I presented at the beginning of the hacker community as a meritocracy. So in thinking about social ties, how does a person become known as a, as a skilled player? It could be by posting, it could be by engaging in different activities and selling them and gaining access to them. But if you're interested in, say, something like status or engaging in a cause-based attack, we've increasingly seen the emergence of tools and resources to identify those who might be good at hacking. And there's a group, for instance, called the Cyber Warrior Team. They operate out of Turkey, and they operate a skill set game where you can go through, sorry, 
and uh, test your capabilities. The more that you can complete, the more of their hacking challenges on the site that you can uh, run through, the higher your overall placement might be should you want to join the group and engage in attacks on their behalf. Their organizational complexity is such that they actually have posted a, a basic organizational chart on their website. If you work in any kind of large industry setting, you've probably seen these kinds of organizational charts before. This might give you something of a laugh to think about a hacker group operating in this fashion. But you can see that they have a very specific structure. At the top, there's a mission, and the mission is driven by a few people. And from there, we have individual actors with different roles and different utilities. There's an administrative group sort of in the middle. And below that, there are sub-moderators who have specific roles. So some groups are extremely organized, but these are relative isolates compared to the rest of what we know about the hacker community writ large. And in thinking about the TERFs, they're a unique group. And their behaviors are different from some others. For instance, this is a quote from a Turkish hacker who we had the chance to interview who talked about how hacker groups come together in Turkey. They don't do anything sophisticated. They will just come together quickly, ask some questions, and then they will engage in some kind of attack. They team up. Someone will engage in a defacement, and then everyone gets to take credit for it. It becomes a team job, as he said, even though a single person usually discovers it. So, just because a group gets ascribed to an attack doesn't mean that it was driven by multiple actors. Instead, it might just be that one person in the group got it, made the attack happen, and therefore attributed it to their larger network. And with all of this in mind, we can now take just a second to consider the subculture of hackers and how this relates to a certain degree with attackers. And in thinking about the hacker community, the more time you spend with individuals, whether they are engaged in the legitimate end of hacking or the malicious activities engaged in hacking, or that involve hacking, there are a few things that come to bear on actors. That's their understanding of technology, their knowledge with various devices and their ability to apply it, their commitment to this pursuit, how much of an interest they have and how much of their time they spend doing it, and then finally, two legal structures that are in place, whether to prosecute activities inside of a country or against another target. And I'll show you some examples of what I mean as we move forward. And these are all taken from either forums or from interviews we were able to complete with hackers who are active in different communities. Starting with this issue of technology, the more that a person knows, the more access that they have to different devices, whether mobile devices, laptops, desktops, any kind of system, the greater their appreciation will be. Uh, these are two quotes from Turkish hackers, one by the name of Blue Crown, who said that technology has always been something they're interested in. I try to follow technology on a day-to-day -day basis. And Ghost61 said, I didn't go to school. I was in front of my computer all the time. I didn't study. I hacked. I didn't go out. I hacked. I worked on it a lot and learned new things. These kinds of comments, though they are distinct to Turkish actors, we see across various communities, whether it's in the US, Russia, the UK, uh, South Africa, South America, wherever. And this emphasis on spending time is very important. Going to different resources is critical. So whether it's going to conferences, uh, as mentioned by this first actor, Crash, who's a very skilled malware writer, he was talking about wanting to go to a hacker conference, Interop Moscow. And he wanted to see a discussion about fighting rootkits, because he was developing his own rootkit tools. Uh, this next quote from the Bakir, a Turkish hacker, talked about going to different websites, and that wasn't sufficient enough for him. So he kept practicing and fiddled around and eventually learned by making things break. We've heard the same kind of commentary from hackers in various contexts. It's about being able to learn from a mistake or an error or making a system break. In turn, you understand what happened and then try to fix it. And it's that kind of practical application of knowledge that is of significant value. And knowledge is critical because it defines who you are and what you can do. The more that a hacker knows, the better their attack can be. This goes back to that quote from Iscorpitz at the beginning. The more you know, the different types of attacks you can engage in. And attackers can use this to their advantage, because those who know how to hack 
will provide information to those who don't know, and in turn, they can engage in different behaviors. This quote from Saint is a Chinese hacker who we follow from time to time, and his complaint is that Chinese hackers have lost the spirit of hacking, the desire to learn, and instead it's focused primarily on criminal acts. We've got a, he says, we have a misunderstanding of hackers. Hackers are the wrecker of the internet. Hackers who criticize are everywhere. So this goes back to a more traditional definition of hacker as somebody who's making systems work in ways that were not otherwise possible, going back to the 50s and the 60s with this idea of hackers as skilled programmers rather than criminal actors which emerged in the 80s and the 90s. In thinking about knowledge, given that there are now markets where people can go to buy tools and different materials, we see a real distribution of skill and of understanding. And this is just one example of what I mean. Smash, the individual who's talking at the beginning, is providing an explanation of how his malware works. Someone asked, how big is the Trojan? It's 25 kilobytes. How does it operate? How do I make it spread? He says, I can offer you a pack of exploits or an eye worm that will help you to spread it. And can you post a link to a tutorial? You run the executable and you're infected, or you make somebody else run it, or you see the previous answer. So he's trying to explain to those who might not have any real understanding or appreciation for how the malware works to get them in order to buy it. Uh, and this quote from the bottom from Jeeves, this really communicates the idea of how much individuals know in some of these marketplaces. He says, okay, explain this to me like I'm a five-year-old. To be able to infect a computer, you would need to open an exe file on it or the executable, or could you download it from the internet? Do you need administrative rights, etc.? And he says, sorry, I'm not computer literate. Oh, and how do you retrieve the info? So, given that there's this marketplace for materials, it means that you now have high-risk actors connecting with no-risk or low-risk actors and trying to share or use the same tools. So it's changing the landscape for hacking in an interesting way. In thinking about this market, what's important to note is that positive feedback affects individuals abilities. The more favorable information that's posted about you or your products as a seller, the more likely you are to get repeat business. So this series of quotes pertained to an individual who released a tool to join malware together with other resources. So say if you wanted to send a specific tool to a person to infect their system, his tool FreeJoiner would take that malware and combine it with say a picture or a PDF file or a PowerPoint or even an image and increase the likelihood that the person not only would get the file, that it would get through their antivirus software, but that it would be attractive enough for them to open. And the positive feedback that's provided here suggests this is a reliable seller, someone you would want to work with. Things like, uh, I like this joiner, it's the best one that I've seen, it's one of the most powerful products on the market, huge, huge respect to the sponsor of the program, uh, it's super easy to use, words cannot explain, great respect. So this means this is a person who knows what they're doing and has tailored their resources specifically to the audience. So knowledge influences what you can do and what you're exposed to. For those high-skilled hackers, what's important to note is they're, they're going to be committed to the learning process. They're going to spend as much time as they can learning about hacking because the more they know, the more effective they'll be. This is a quote from an individual hacker's blog that we follow, where he was talking about how many days he's been spending working on a piece of malware, uh, specifically to work on Linux systems. He's been up for days, he's been smoking, he's been reading manuals, he's been having a really hard time of it. Finally, after being up for days, he decided to take a couple of sleeping pills, and now that he's finally awake and gotten some sleep, he's feeling a little bit better. But in the course of all the time that he'd spent being committed to this specific project. He wasn't necessarily being careful about his own security. And he posted this image of his operating system and his general work environment. You can see this is just his shot of his apartment. Uh, he's got multiple laptops running, giant empty bottle of vodka there in the middle with a glass next to it, and uh, multiple systems running Ali Debug and other programs trying to develop this specific tool. So. This is all he'd been doing. In fact, you can see the open manual here in the corner. Very committed to this specific project. And in doing so, this is the type of actor who we might be extremely concerned about. 
as a high-risk player because whatever they develop is going to be used for something much more sophisticated. But that sophisticated tool might eventually bleed down into the mid and low tier of the community. Now a final issue of concern with the hacker and attacker community is their ability to understand and recognize that there are laws that limit their ability to operate with impunity. Many of the hackers and data thieves and groups that we look at are quick to say who and how their tools can be used or when and how they might be able to be used. Uh, this quote from Zoomer here, in markets where people sell personally identifiable information, they'll sell dumps for credit card and bank account numbers but they don't sell PIN numbers. It's thought that that's a criminal activity, that's something that you will easily get caught for, but I will sell you dumps. Just don't ask me for dumps and PINs. This individual Zoomer sold lots and lots of data, but just specifically said, don't ask if I sell dumps and PINs. That's illegal. So that might be the kind of cue for law enforcement that, hey, don't ask this person for dumps and PINs, but ask them for different kinds of data. We also see language like in the second quote here, often attributed to malware that's either sold or made freely available for download. It's a tool for testing network vulnerability. If you are interested in, say, red teaming or you're a penetration tester, you might be able to use this tool to help you in your day-to-day -day activities. But if you use this for illegal activities, that's not our responsibility. It's not our problem how you use it. It's only how you want to get a hold of it want to pay for this, great. We don't have any reasonable uh, responsibility for when you use it and how you use it, only that we give you access to it. In fact, uh, the group the Hell Knights grew was a big group in 2007, 8, 9 in Russia, and they had this long list of exploits and different malware that you could download directly from their site. But they were quick to say, we don't bear any responsibility for how you use it. Instead, you can just come here, you can learn a lot, we're just giving this to the general public. What you choose to do with it is not our responsibility. So, in thinking about the hacker community and the attacker community generally, we can think that the attackers are shaped in large part by the capabilities of hackers. Hackers develop tools, release them, and they facilitate the behavior of the less skilled. The less skilled can eventually move up the chain depending on how much of their own time they invest in it, but there's a definite hierarchy within the overall community. In thinking about motives, there are various different motives that can be ascribed. They're going to vary by place and by time. But in terms of how individuals judge one another, it doesn't matter if you're uh, hacking for money, hacking for your nation, what's going to be of most importance is what you know and how you apply it in a day-to-day -day setting. And hackers can easily justify what they're doing through educational purposes. They might say, hey, you can use this for a specific kind of penetration testing, or you can use this to check to see how secure your own system is. But what you choose to do with that outside of that is not our responsibility. And because of that awareness, it can be somewhat difficult to find ways to reduce this type of threat. If you can download a tool from anywhere, how do we make it easier to identify the responsible party? If you're using a tool that's been around for 10 years that has multiple fingerprints on it or multiple signatures, then how do we know that an attack that utilizes a tool from Turkey and appears to come from somewhere inside of the U.S. is actually from a specific point in time? So it can become terms of actor attribution to determine who is responsible and in what ways. And in thinking about this even further, it's hard to figure out a way to disrupt the hacker community and the attacker community because there's no easy way to take out a single group. If you remove one malware writer, that doesn't mean that you've effectively crippled the community. Instead, someone else can rise to take their place. So we have to find ways to more effectively think about reducing the overall effectiveness of malicious actors rather than just taking a sort of onesie twosie approach that knocks out a single player rather than a larger network. And all of these issues speak to some broader ideas about computer security generally. In your own environments, if you're a computer security professional or if you're thinking strategically about how your resources might be affected, there's value in thinking about the motive of the attacker and how your specific resources could be impacted. 
for instance, if we're thinking about, say, a politically driven attacker or someone who's interested in gaining attention for either themselves or a specific cause, they might choose to attack your web space and engage in a defacement because they get a big splash, people will see the page, they'll perhaps not do anything malicious, they might not even have enough skill to do something malicious, but they can easily change the home page. And so that's a different type of attack than someone who's interested in, say, sensitive intellectual property where they might be compromising a single machine in order to establish a beachhead versus perhaps a truly and purely money-driven attacker who's looking for customer data or something sensitive that they can in turn resell. So these are different factors that could affect what your company or what your specific products might be affected by. And in a general conversation about securing resources, one of the biggest concerns are the individual end users. Because if you've got a weak point for that one individual who opens every attachment, or who is quick to visit a website based on any kind of comment about what might be hosted there. That's a pretty serious flaw in security because all it takes is that one system to be compromised that allows attackers access and ingress into a larger system, whether that's through the use of spam or some kind of downloadable or uh, exploit pack. And as a consequence, given that all these tools are readily available, you can be affected in a much more profound way than, say, 10 to 15 years ago when the hacker community was a little bit differently structured. The attacker is going to have to find different ways to be successful relative to the more skilled hacker who's interested in malicious attacks, who has the ability to generate resources on their own. So with all of that having been said, uh, let me just quickly give a plug for IGI Global. Uh, generally, we have our book, uh, Corporate Hacking and Technology Driven Crime. This was edited by myself and uh, Bernadette Shell. And we have a number of articles in the book that uh, pertain to some of the issues we've talked about today. And the same with the Encyclopedia of Cyber Behavior. So I'll uh, turn it over to questions at this point, And uh, thank you for your time. Well, again, thank you to uh, everyone who signed on. Uh, should you have any questions, please feel free. Now's a great time to ask. We have a question from Nick. He asked, um, any suggestions for best tools for protection? That is a very good question. Uh, I don't have a specific vendor that I recommend, but rather I simply recommend that everyone have Antivirus software, uh, in some cases, the more the merrier. If your system is one that will allow for, say, a Norton Security Suite and uh, some sort of anti-spyware tool or uh, any kind of resource that allows for multiple scans and running those scans on a daily basis or, if nothing else, a weekly basis is always very good. If you use an Android cell phone, uh, one that is or has the uh, option to buy an antivirus kit. That is also a very good idea. Increasingly, the mobile space is one that can be readily compromised, but not so easily uh, tracked down and secured, uh, whereas iPhone, to the best of my knowledge, does not have an antivirus suite as of yet. Uh, if you use one of those devices, I would highly recommend it. Uh, also, regularly clearing out cookies in your browser, clearing the cache, and uh, being very careful about when and how you use a public computer or a device that's not your own is, is imperative. So I suggest just taking as many of the most reasonable steps as is possible. The, 
the biggest flaw is uh, having antivirus and then never running it or never updating it. It's like uh, having locks and a car alarm on your car that you never use. Stephen asked, so it appears that teaching end users is not very worthwhile. Is that correct? Uh, teaching end users is a necessity. The extent to which they comprehend it or manage it is something else. The more that we can pursue sort of a whole cloth approach to security, the better. Because if we continue to treat end users as groups that don't know and will never understand the technology that you're using, the more that we're enabling this kind of security flaw to exist. So uh, as perhaps noted in the recent Department of Defense reports, the more that we can approach computer security as perhaps even uh, something like a hygiene issue, whereas if you brush your teeth and your hair and shower on a daily basis just in order to ensure good health, we should think the same thing about our computing environments. So it's a hard message to drill home to the end user, but it's one that we should pursue as much as is possible, even though, yes, it, it is very, very hard to accomplish. Shalin asks, could you share how you conduct your research in various language spaces online? Sure. Uh, we try to use machine tools only if we're looking for a very, very quick gist of a specific site. But typically, we try to employ either students or uh, faculty researchers who have a specific language skill. So for instance, someone who can easily speak and read Russian and give us that context for uh, what the site is explaining or describing, that's much more valuable to us than a quick Google Translate of a site. Uh, some, uh, some languages like Turkish, for example, do not translate well through a machine program. But someone who can give us that uh, specific context for a language or for certain characterizations or for technical details, that, that makes it that much better for us. So we try to be open and have research partners who have different uh, linguistic skills in order to ensure we have uh, good comprehension. Shellen also asked, are our real larger size threats from amateurs or from the pros? Uh, the real and serious threats like, say, APT1, as noted in the Mandiant report, are the high-skilled actors who we should be concerned about because of their ability to operate for long periods of time with high anonymity. So they are a harder threat to immediately identify. The uh, signal-to-noise ratio, I guess if you want to put it that way, you're going to get a lot more signals and noise, or pardon me, you're going to get a lot more noise from the unskilled attackers, but the serious threat is from those very quiet and persistent ones who can get in without quick identification. I don't believe we have any other questions. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone, again for uh, for listening. It was a very nice experience. Thank you for having me. Just to close up really quickly, um, thank you so much, Dr. Holt, for the wonderful presentation. And thank you to everyone as well who had the opportunity to come out today. Um, our webinar today will be recorded, and attendees will receive a link to access it directly once again. It is also available online at our website under online symposiums, where viewers can also see our previously recorded symposiums. For more information on Dr. Holt's publications or for more information on IGI Global products and publications, please visit our website. Our Gene Symposium will feature Montana State University librarians Mary Ann Hansen and Sheila Bonnard, and they will be sharing experiences with expanding instructional services by adding synchronous library instruction to better serve online students and faculty across the globe. Thank you again for joining us today, and we hope to see you at a future 
symposium and event. If you have any questions in the meantime, feel free to contact me at the address you see on screen. Thank you.